Last class we were discussing about the dis various design parameters of activated sludge process. We have seen in detail the design criteria of aerators, how, how we can select aerators and how many aerators we have to provide and all. And we also started seeing what are these ponds and lagoons. So we have discussed about various types of ponds, those are aerobic ponds, facultative ponds, anaerobic ponds, then we also talked about aerated lagoons and polishing ponds. So, what is a pond? Pond is nothing but it is a earthen, large earthen basin in which wastewater is retained long enough for natural purification process to provide necessary degree of treatment. So, here we are not giving any extra treatment whatever is happening by the natural process. It is we are al allowing enough time for the wastewater to stay there so that the natural process will take care of the pollutant whatever is present in the wastewater and with respect to time everything will be purified and the water will be of discharge quality. So, that is what a pond, we are utilizing the natural phenomena for the treatment of the wastewater and we have seen that the pond usually the same thing is called by different names oxidation pond, stabilization pond, sewage lagoon etcetera etcetera and here the oxygen supply is because of photosynthesis that is one, one way how the pond is getting the oxygen and another way is by the natural replenishment because whatever the oxygen present in the waste water it will be consumed by the microorganism when they utilize the food or it is a biochemical oxygen demand that will be consumed by the microorganism. So, naturally the dissolved oxygen concentration in the waste water will be coming down and if you see the saturation concentration of oxygen in water varies from 8 to 9.2 within the uh, available temperature means what, what I mean is if the temperature is in between 20 to 30 degree centigrade that is the usual temperature experience in our country especially in the southern part of our country. So, during this period okay, if the what we allow the oxygen concentration to get saturated we will be getting a value in between 8 to 9.2 milligrams per liter. But when organic matter is there and microorganisms are utilizing the organic matter, the oxygen will be consumed at a faster rate and the dissolved oxygen concentration in the wastewater will be almost nil or it will be in the range of 1 or 2 milligrams per liter. So, there exists a great concentration gradient because from the saturation concentration to the concentration whatever is existing in the wastewater there is a drastic difference. This concentration gradient drives more oxygen to get dissolved in the wastewater. So, that is the way how the oxygen concentration is increasing in the ponds. And we have already discussed what is an aerobic pond. It is a shallow pond less than 1 meter in length depth where dissolved oxygen is maintained throughout the, throughout the depth of the tank that is an aerobic pond. And facultative pond also we have discussed here the pond depth varies from 1 to 2.5 meters. So, we will be having an aerobic zone then a facultative zone and an anaerobic zone. So, in anaerobic zone all the sludge will be settling down and it will undergo anaerobic degradation because since oxygen is not available there anaerobic bacteria will be growing at a faster rate in that region. So, they will be converting this sludge organic sludge whatever is settled in the bottom of the tank and as a result the biogas that means methane and carbon dioxide will be generated and sometimes because of the presence of inorganic substance like sulphate, nitrate etcetera in the waste, it will be getting reduced to sulphide and ammonia. 
So, we may get hydrogen sulphide and ammonia also from the bottom layer. So, what, what will happen as it comes up okay, in the facultative layer, it will be having both aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. The facultative bacteria are those which can survive in aerobic condition as well as anaerobic condition. So, the middle layer of the pond will be in facultative condition and top layer will be completely in aerobic condition. There the photosynthesis will be providing enough oxygen photosynthesis and the natural replenishment will be giving enough oxygen for the microorganism because of that one the organic matter will be getting oxidized and whatever is the inorganic compounds coming in the reduced form that also will be getting oxidized in, in that zone because of the availability of oxygen. And anaerobic pond is the one which is very deep and throughout the length of the tank anaerobic condition will be prevailing. So, this type of ponds are used to treat high organic load wastewater. For example, if you take the distillery wastewater, the COD varies from 30,000 to 1 lakh or few lakhs depending upon the process. So, if you want to treat them aerobically, you can imagine what is the amount of oxygen we have to supply because we have seen that for 1 kilogram COD destruction or 1 kilogram BOD destruction, we have to supply 1 to 2 kilograms of oxygen depending upon the process, either it is a conventional activated sludge process or an extended aeration process. So, if the COD is so high, how can we transfer that much of oxygen? That is one problem. Another one is to transfer that much of oxygen. What is the power required? That is also too high and the economics or the cost, operational cost involved in such systems will be very, very high. So, what usually practiced in treatment of high organic waste, waste high organic clot wastewaters is first go for anaerobic treatment because anaerobic process will be taking care of a major portion of the organic matter and it will be getting converted to methane and carbon dioxide apart from new cells. So, the COD will be or the BOD will be getting reduced around 50 to 60 percentage in the anaerobic reactors or the anaerobic pond and afterwards it will be coming to facultative facultative pond or aerobic pond and it will be getting treated to the required degree. So, we can eliminate or we can avoid the extra or excessive oxygen requirement and which will not be available by the natural replenishment process. So, that is why we prefer anaerobic pond for high strength wastewaters. And now coming to the maturation ponds, this I have discussed earlier in the previous class. Maturation ponds are the ponds used for polishing effluents from other biological processes. For example, if you go for conventional activated sludge process or anaerobic process, nowadays the upflow anaerobic sludge blanket reactors are coming up and many municipalities are employing those type of process for the wastewater treatment. But the disadvantage of such process is the the destruction of microorganism whatever is present in the wastewater is very very low. The destruction of pathogens or the disease causing microorganism whatever is present in the system after passing through such treatment unit is only 1 or 2 log. That means, if you have 10 raise to 7 number of microorganisms per ml that is the usual average concentration of microorganism present in domestic wastewater. After treating it in a anaerobic process and the effluent if you check for the microbial concentration, we will be finding around 10 raise to 4 to 10 raise to 5 or sometimes even 10 raise to 6 numbers of organism per ml. And if you want to discharge this water to existing water bodies, it is not advisable and the standards will not allow you to discharge such wastewater to the inland water bodies. So, in such cases what we have to do? We have to destruct the microbial concentration and we have discussed that discussed in water treatment, we can destroy the microorganism using disinfection process, but is it advisable to go for disinfection in, in case of wastewater? The answer will be no, because the amount of chlorine required for the destruction of microorganism as well as the non-biodegradable organic matter whatever is present in the wastewater, it will be very, very high. So, the cost involved in the process will be extremely high. 
So, it is not advisable to go for chlorination after the secondary treatment. Moreover, there will be many organic compounds. So, what will happen? This chlorine will be reacting with this organic compounds and it will be forming organochlorine compounds. And most of the organic organochlorine compounds are carcinogenic in nature and they are very difficult to degrade. So, if you treat it with chlorine and whatever is the treated effluent, if you discharge into the inland water bodies, that water, water must be may be used by somebody as a source or raw water source for the water supply. So, naturally all these organochlorine compounds will be present there and most of the treatment 100 percentage removal of this organochlorine compounds may not take place. So, it is not advisable. So, the solution for such problem is go for polishing ponds. In polishing ponds what we are doing is allow the water to stay for long time and most of the polishing ponds are aerobic ponds and we have seen aerobic pond throughout the depth of the pond aerobic condition will be prevailing or dissolved oxygen will be available throughout the depth of the tank. So, what will happen in the tank or the pond will be exposed to sunlight and sunlight we know so much of UV radiation will be coming and because of this UV radiation and adverse environmental conditions most of the pathogens will be getting destructed. So, whatever we are getting the effluent whatever we are getting from the oxidation pond or the polishing pond will be meeting the effluent discharge standard in in case of pathogens or the microbial concentration or in with respect to most probable number as well as the organic matter because we are providing such a long detention time in the polishing unit or the polishing pond. So, what will happen definitely there are microorganisms present in the system and oxygen is available continuously. So, this microorganisms will be utilizing the leftover organic matter water has come out of the secondary treatment and they will be converting it into carbon dioxide and fresh cells. So, your effluent whatever is coming from the polishing unit will be much better compared to the one what is coming out of the secondary treatment unit. So, that is the purpose of a maturation pond or a polishing pond. Now, we have we will see aerated lagoon this also I have explained in the last class. In aerated lagoon what, what we are doing is most of the time the oxygen transfer by natural replenishment or the re because of the re aeration process from the atmosphere oxygen is getting into the pond system. But if the wastewater strength is very high ok most of the time this oxygen transfer will not be sufficient to give enough oxygen for the microorganism for the oxidation of the organic matter. In such cases what we do? We supply air by mechanical means by using surface aerators or diffused aerators. If in a pond if you use artificial aeration then that is known as a lagoon. Lagoons also can be classified into aerated lagoon and facultative lagoon. In aer aerobic lagoon all the suspended solids whatever is present in the wastewater everything will be in suspension complete mixing will be taking place that is an a a aerobic lagoon. In facultative lagoon what happens? It will be having just like facultative pond an anaerobic zone and a facultative zone and an aerobic zone. So, in the anaerobic zone the sludge will be there that means some, some or a certain amount of the sludge will be settling down in the bottom of the tank all the sludge whatever is present, present in the wastewater or all the suspended solids whatever is present in the wastewater will not be available in suspended form that is a facultative lagoon and anaerobic degradation will be taking place and all the all other treatment are exactly similar to a facultative pond only thing we are providing aeration artificially or by mechanical means. Now, we will see what exactly is happening in a pond ok we will discuss the system biology in detail ok. So, this is a facultative pond why I am discussing about the facultative pond is in most of the cases especially for municipal wastewater treatment we go for a facultative pond because aerobic pond maintaining an aerob aerobic pond will be very very difficult and the area required for such pond will be tremendous. So, the land cost will be so high so it is practice that most of the time for domestic wastewater treatment or municipal wastewater treatment facultative 
points are usually used. Okay. So, the facultative points are having three distinguished layers. This is the anaerobic layer you can see here and this is the facultative zone and this is the aerobic zone. So, what is happening in anaerobic zone? Here the microbial anaerobic bacteria will be present and as because of the anaerobic bacterial degradation, volatile organic acids are produced and that will be coming into the top layer and biogas will be produced that means methane and carbon dioxide will be produced here that also will be coming up from the system and, and we will be getting reduced compounds of nitrogen, phosphorus and sulphur and here in the top layer we have the aerobic layer. So, in aerobic layer what is happening there the symbiotic action of aerobic bacteria and algae is taking place. What is this symbiotic action? Symbiotic action is the action by two group of microorganisms or two groups in such a way that the activity of one group helps the other group and vice versa. That means, both the groups are inter interdependent that is a symbiotic action. So, how the symbiotic action is taking place in an oxidation pond? So, what happens if the organic matter is present? The microorganisms will be utilizing the organic matter and they will be converting it into carbon dioxide and water and as a result more new cells will be produced. But what will happen when algae is present? Algae will not be using any organic matter whatever is present in the waste water because we know that algae can generate or produce organic matter by using carbon dioxide and this organic matter thus produced by photosynthesis is used for the cytoplasm formation. So, the carbon dioxide whatever is released by the microorganism will be utilized by algae and that carbon dioxide will be used by them in photo photosynthesis process and it will be getting converted into cytoplasm or other organic material and that will be released to the system. And in the process of photosynthesis what will happen? water will be getting oxidized and oxygen will be released. So, during photosynthesis more and more oxygen will be available to the microorganism which can utilize the organic matter and convert the organic matter into carbon dioxide and water. So, this carbon dioxide will be utilized by the algae. So, algae will be producing oxygen that is being used by microorganism or bacteria and bacteria will be utilizing the organic matter and producing carbon dioxide that will be utilized by the algae. So, that is why we call it as a symbiotic relationship. So, because of this photosynthesis as well as the re aeration more and more oxygen will be available in the pond. But what will happen in night time whether the algae will be able to produce photosynthesis produce oxygen? It is not possible because photosynthesis requires sunlight. So, night time algae will not be able to produce any oxygen and moreover for their respiration they need oxygen. So, if you see the dissolved oxygen concentration in a pond it will be varying diurnally that means there will be a drastic change in dissolved oxygen concentration if you see in daytime and night time. Night time definitely the dissolved oxygen concentration will be less compared to daytime because daytime oxygen is entering in the system because of photosynthesis and Night time, what are the oxygen entering in the system due to re aeration from the atmosphere by natural process? It will be consumed by both bacteria and algae. And one more thing, what will be the condition of pH in the system? Whether the pH will remain a constant throughout the day? It is not because what is happening is because of the microbial degradation, carbon dioxide will be produced in the system and we know that if carbon dioxide get dissolved in water it will be forming carbonic acid and carbonic acid will bring down the pH of the system. But in daytime what is happening in an oxidation pond is whatever carbon dioxide released by the microorganism it will be immediately consumed by the algae for the photosynthesis. So, the carbon dioxide concentration will be less or the dissolved carbon dioxide concentration in the pond will be less. So, because of that one naturally the pH of the system will be high, but what will happen in night time? The algae will be doing the respiration and bacteria will be 
during their respiration. So, as a result, carbon dioxide will be produced by both the organisms and all the carbon dioxide whatever is pro produced in the system will be remaining in the system because algae will not be able to do any photosynthesis during night time. So, the concentration of carbon dioxide will be very very high in night time because of that one the pH of the system will be coming down. So, if you see the day time and night time there will be a very drastic variation or a measurable variation of dissolved oxygen concentration as well as pH in the system. So, this is the working principle of a oxidation pond. So, the major one is the symbiotic relationship between the algae and bacteria. Because of this symbiotic relationship, okay, it is very, very difficult to model the pond system. And it is also reported that or we have seen already that the major contributor for the COD removal or, or the organic matter removal, removal is bacteria. Because algae utilize only carbon dioxide for their cell synthesis. But it is reported that certain algae can use the organic matter in a heterotrophic pathway and generate more and more algal cells. But the contribution by those type of algae are very, very insignificant compared to the bacterial contribution. So, as far as the COD removal is concerned, bacteria are the major contributors. But to maintain a high dissolved oxygen concentration, algae plays a significant role. So, that is what we have seen the symbiotic relationship between algae and bacteria that is what is taking place in a pond system and this is the most important thing. Okay, if you have more algae in the system definitely the dissolved oxygen concentration in the system will be high. Now, we will see how can we design a pond or a lagoon. Okay. So, either we can go for a CSTR approach or we can go for a plug flow approach. So, if you want to go for a CSTR ap approach, we can use this equation. Okay. What is the BOD in? Okay. Mass balance if you take it, that is equal to BOD out plus BOD consumed because mass cannot be distracted. So, it will be appearing in some other way. So, that is what whatever is the BOD coming into the system. That, that is equal to BOD out plus BOD consumed by the microorganisms whatever is present in the system. So, we can write like this what is the total BOD coming to the system that is nothing but fluoride into the BOD concentration that is Q into S naught that is equal to Q into S that is the BOD present in the outlet Q into S plus V into K into S that this is the reaction whatever is taking place in the system or this is the rate at which the organic matter is getting removed from the system where K is the reaction rate constant per day and as we have seen it is the BOD of the outlet water because it is a CSTR reactor as soon as S0 enters in the system because of the complete mixing it will be instantaneously changing to S yes, that is why we are using V into K into S and Theta we have already seen this is the hydraulic retention time that means what is the amount of time the water is staying in the treatment system and V is the reactor volume and Q is the flow rate. So, if you want to write an equation we can write like this S by S naught is equal to 1 by 1 plus K into V by Q because in the earlier equation we have seen Q into S naught is equal to Q S plus V into K S. So, from that one we will be getting this equation S by S naught is equal to 1 by 1 plus K into V by Q and we know that volume by flow rate is nothing but the hydraulic retention time. So, the equation can be modified like this S by S naught is equal to 1 by 1 plus K theta. So, this is the treatment efficiency in a single pond, but if you have n number of ponds what will be the outlet concentration? we can write like this S by S naught is equal to 1 by 1 plus K theta by N because this is the detention time in each pond because theta is the total detention time. So, if you have N, N tanks then theta by N will be the hydraulic retention time in each tank and it will be raised to N. Okay. So, S by S naught is equal to 1 by 1 plus K theta by N raised to N or if you are talking about the microorganism because the ponds can be utilized as a polishing unit also. In that case, if you want to find out what is the 
outlet microbial concentration we can use this formula n by n naught where n naught is the initial microbial concentration that is equal to 1 by 1 plus k theta by n raised to n. So, this is the this is some design parameters of a facultative pond and a facultative lagoon. So, detention time of a facultative pond varies from 7 to 30 days. In facultative lagoon, it is 7 to 20 days because we are giving aeration artificially and depth varies from 1 to 2 meters and here it can be 1 to 2.5 meters and BOD loading kilogram per hectare here it can vary from 15 to 18 kilogram BOD per hectare. In facultative lagoon we can go up to 50 to 200 kilogram per hectare because we are supplying air externally and BOD conversion or the treatment efficiency is 80 to 95 in both the systems. And effluent suspended solids if you see in facultative ponds it will be in the range of 400 to 40 to 100 milligrams per litre whereas in facultative lagoon it is 40 to 60 milligrams per litre. So, if you supply air externally we can improve the efficiency and we can reduce the land or the area requirement. And it, we have seen the design of a facultative pond based upon CSTR concept, but we know that there is no complete mixing taking place in any pond system and we know that it is not completely a plug flow reactor also because the turbulence will be introduced because of the temperature gradi gradient and because of the wind velocity because wind will be blowing and this is such a vast area open to the atmosphere. So, because of that one there will be turbulence. So, in most of the cases the ponds whatever we are considering they are neither plug flow or CSTR. So, it will come in between plug flow and CSTR. So, if you know where it stands then depending upon the efficiency required we can find out what is the detention time we have to give in the ponds. Okay. So, this family of curves are available and here the x axis gives the percentage remaining that means S by S naught if S naught is the initial concentration and S is the effluent concentration. So, this is the percentage BOD remaining in the system. So, if you want to know what is the if you know what is the efficiency you want to achieve by the pond system then you will be knowing what is the percentage remaining. So, corresponding to that one depending upon the flow regime or mixing regime we can find out what is the k theta value we have to provide ok theta is nothing but the HRT and k is the degradation constant ok. This is available for oxidation ponds and it will be varying with various parameters. So, now we will see if you want to design a pond based upon this empirical or semi rational approach because we know that we cannot go for the CSTR approach and design a pond because most of the time the tanks will not be completely mixed. So, in most of the design cases for ponds and lagoons people use semi rational approach or empirical formula ok. So, this is one approach which is most commonly used for the design of ponds. So, what here we are doing is we are finding out the oxygen produced by the algae and we know what is the oxygen requirement by the biomass. So, we can find out what is the area requirement. So, we will see this design approach in detail. So, first step is we have to find out what is the net algae produced that means kilogram of algae per hectare per day that is the net algae produced we are expressing in this unit algae per hectare per day. So, it is proportional to the sunlight available because if sunlight is there then photosynthesis will be more efficient and as a result more and more algal cells will be produced. So, that is why this formula is being used the algae net algae produced is equal to 0.3 into F into S where F is the percentage efficiency of photosynthesis and usually we take it 3 to 4 percentage because if that much of sunlight is available. So, 3 to 4 percentage is the efficiency of photosynthesis and this is the solar radiation incident at that place and the unit can be either cal calories per centimeter square per day or kilojoules per meter square per day. So, if you can put that one here you will be getting what is the net algae produced in 
kilogram okay kilogram algae per hectare per day now what we have to do we have to find out algae produce we know now we want to find out what is the oxygen produced by this amount of algae because we know what is the total quantity of algae produced using the formula then we can find out what is the net oxygen produced by the algae and by experiments it has shown that the algae produce 1.6 times al the algal mass so if you know the total algae produce the total oxygen produced is 1.6 times the algae available that means 1.6 times algae produced in kilogram per hectare per day and now we will see what is the oxygen available for oxidation of the organic matter by the bacteria whatever the total oxygen produced it will not be available for the microorganism for the ox oxidation so we are assuming whatever the al oxygen production by the algae only 70 percentage of the oxygen is available for the microorganism so from these informations we can find out what is the permissible BOD loading permissible BOD loading is nothing but what is the oxygen available in the system so we have seen what is the total algae produced and if you know the total algae produced what is the oxygen produced by the algae that is nothing but 1.6 times the mass of the algae per hectare per day and we also seen that whatever the oxygen produced by the algae 100 percentage is not available for the microorganism for the organic matter conversion so we are taking a factor of 0.7 because we are assuming that whatever the oxygen available only 70 percentage is available for the microorganism so if these informations are available we can find out what is the permissible organic loading rate permissible organic loading rate is nothing but the total oxygen available so this is what i have given here it is nothing but 0.7 that is coming from this factor into 1.6 into 0.3 into f into s so this much is the bod loading permissible so bod load to the pond is also known because we know what is the amount of water we have to treat this is the fluoride and this is the initial bod so you know what is the load coming to the pond it is nothing but q into s naught and you know the permissible loading rate so we can find out what is the area required that is nothing but bod load divided by permissible bod loading rate that means q into s naught divided by 0 0.7 into 1.6 into 0 0.3 into f into s and we are assuming that the pond is having a flow regime of plug flow so if it is a plug flow reactor then we can provide a l is to length is to width ratio of 4 to 5 is to 1 so we know the ratio then we can find out what is the length and what is the width we, we can provide and we know the theta which is equal to hrt can be determined by v by q that is the hrt so once the volume is known now volume is known and q is known we will be knowing the hrt and we can check whether your design is correct by using other procedures so i will explain once again so what we have to do here is first we have to find out okay this this design is based upon empirical results or many research have been conducted in the field on pond system and based upon the result obtained from them from that results that this design approach is developed so first one what we are doing is what is the algal production algal production will depend uh, algal production depends upon the solar incidence so we can find out the algal production per hectare per day using the formula 0 0.3 into f into s f is the efficiency of photosynthesis and usually it varies from 3 to 4 percentage once the algae is produced then our interest is how much is the oxygen supplied by this algae and that also we know that a factor 1.6 can be used for the calculation of oxygen pro produced by the algae because that also this constant 1.6 also is got from the experimental results so we know what is the oxygen produced by the algae now we will see how much oxygen is available for the microorganism for the oxidation of the organic matter so we are assuming that out of the total oxygen available only 70 percentage is available for the microorganism so we know what is the oxygen available so this oxygen available is nothing but the permissible organic loading 
because if that much of organic matter comes to the system okay this much oxygen is available so it can be converted into carbon dioxide and water and you will be getting 100 percentage efficiency so you with this data we can get the permissible organic loading and you know that what is the total load going to come to your system because we know what is the quantity of waste water we have to treat and what is the BOD or organic content of the waste water from that one we can find out what is the total loading to the system and we know the permissible loading so we can find out what is the area required and once the area required is calculated then what do you have to do okay we are assuming that it is a plug flow regime so we can find out what is the length and width we have to provide because we are assuming a ratio of 4 to 5 is to 1 length is to width ratio so we have fixed up the area and you know that what is the depth you have to provide if it is it is an aerobic pond it is 1 meter and if it is a facultative pond we can go up to 2.5 meters so we can provide the depth according to the requirement once the depth length and width is known we know what is the volume of the tank and you know the flow rate so you can find out what is the hrt of the system now we will see how can we find out the efficiency of the system or whether the design is correct okay we can go for some other approach and check whether the HRT whatever we have provided in the system is sufficient to treat the waste. What is the organic matter left over after a particular time? Okay, this is L is equal to L naught into E raised to minus KT. Or from this equation, we can write like, the, like this L naught by L is equal to 10 raised to KT. Here, L naught is nothing but the ultimate BOD and L is the BOD remaining in the system. So, that is equal to 10 raised to KT or we can write like this L naught divided by L naught minus YT which is equal to YT is the BOD exerted. So, L naught minus YT that means whatever is totally present and whatever is removed that is nothing but whatever is left over. So, L naught by L naught minus YT is equal to 10 raised to KT. So, if we take logarithm on both sides we will be getting L log L naught by L is equal to KT or t is equal to 1 by k into log s naught by sc okay s naught is the initial bod and sc is the effluent bod the desired bod so from this one we are getting a time this is nothing but the hydraulic retention time we need to supply to get this efficiency so you check whether this t is less than the earlier t if this t is more than the hydraulic retention time we have provided in the tank then the design is not proper then you have to give more hydraulic ret retention time. So, this is the check for the semi empirical approach. Now, we can come to the same conclusion using the plug flow model theoretically. So, we know that in plug flow this is the concentration variation okay, with respect to the position in the plug flow reactor. So, dc by kc is equal to dx by v and if you integrate over C naught C naught over C E and throughout the length, so we will be getting D C by K C limit C naught to C E is equal to D X by V limit 0 to L or we can write like this 1 by K into L and C naught by C E is equal to L by V. So, here V is nothing but the velocity of flow and D X is the length of the instantaneous or length of that incremental incremental distance. So, we can write like this okay this 1 by k into L and C naught by C e is nothing but L by V. So, if you multiply it with the cross sectional area L by V into H into W is equal to okay L into depth into width is equal to volume and here velocity into cross sectional area is giving you the flow rate. So, V by Q we are getting it here. So, this is nothing but the hydraulic retention time. So, hydraulic re retention time T is nothing but 1 by k into L and C naught by C or S naught by SC. So, this derivation part we have seen earlier. What is the change in concentration with respect to time in this completely mixed batch reactor is equivalent to the change in the concentration with respect to space in a plug flow reactor. So, that is why we are getting this one and you know the concentration is changing from C naught to C e and length is varying from 0 to L.
okay so this derivation we have seen earlier so if you go for go by this plug flow approach also you will be getting the same hydraulic retention time so we can use this hydraulic retention time as a check for the semi rational approach which we use for the design of oxidation pond or a facultative pond so it is always advisable to go for a series of ponds instead of a single pond the reason is if you go for a single pond okay and we know that we will not be able to maintain the plug flow regime throughout the pond system so what will happen okay there will be mixing taking place in the system so the concentration whatever we are putting c0 is initially given to the system and the concentration will be changing to c within a short period of time in the same time so the concentration gradient which is the driving force for the biodegradation because we know that in first order reaction the dc by dt the rate of change of pollutant concentration is proportion is equal to k into c so if c c is nothing but c0 by ce so if c is high the rate of change of concentration will be higher so if you go for a single pond this c value will be less but if you go for a series of ponds okay first it is changing from c0 to c1 then from c1 to c2 c2 to c3 like that in different stages it will be getting converted to c so definitely the efficiency will be much more if you go for a series of ponds instead of a single pond and it is also shown that if you go for a series of ponds the pond volume the all the pond volumes are the same then you will be getting maximum efficiency how can we derive that one it is very simple because we have seen that the formula for s0 by sc is nothing but 1 by 1 plus k theta raised to n if you have n ponds so we will take only two ponds so what will happen okay the efficiency sc by s0 will be equal to 1 by 1 plus k theta, theta 1 into 1 by 1 plus k theta 2 theta 1 and theta 2 are the hydraulic retention times of two independent ponds and if you want to get maximum efficiency that means your sc value should be minimum if you want to get sc by s0 a small value definitely your denominator in this side should be less so if the denominator is nothing but 1 plus k theta 1 into 1 plus k theta 2 so if you want to make that one less so what we have to do, now if you want to make the total value small the denominator should be more that means 1 plus k theta 1 into 1 plus k theta 2 should be maximum or and if you want to make the, make it maximum what and what is the maximum condition we dif, differentiate it with respect to theta and equate it to 0 then we can find out what is the value of theta and from that value we can find out what is the condition required for getting maximum efficiency so if you do the differentiation and equate it to 0 you can see that when theta 1 is equal to theta 2 you will be getting maximum efficiency so this one is true for n series of ponds also so you can try the derivation by yourself so i have already explained how to do it you have to make the denominator maximum to get maximum removal efficiency or a minimum value for sc by s0 so how can we make the denominator maximum so you differentiate it and equate to 0 and find out how the theta 1 and theta 2 is coming so for n, n series of ponds if you provide same hydraulic retention time in each and every tank then you will be getting maximum efficiency and it is advisable to go for a series of ponds instead of having a single pond to get maximum efficiency now we will see the designing of facultative ponds and lagoons so one problem will solve then it will be clear so this is the problem wastewater flow from a small community averages 3500 meter cube per day during the winter and 5500 meter cube per day during summer the average temperature of the coldest month is 8 degrees centigrade and the average temperature of the warmest month is 25 degrees centigrade the average bod5 is 250 milligrams per liter with 70 percentage being soluble the reaction coefficient k is 0 0.23 per day at 20 degree centigrade and the value of phi is 1.06 prepare 
a preliminary design for a facultative pond treatment system for the community to remove 90 percentage of the soluble BOD. So, we have the fluoride in summer and winter and we know what is the extreme temperature available and we know what is the incoming BOD value and what is the soluble part of that one and we also know the biokinetic constant at 20 degree centigrade and the required efficiency is also given. So, based upon this one we have to design the pond system. So, we will discuss in detail okay, what we have to do or how we have to go for the solution. So, first step is compute the rate constants which is adjusted for temperature because we have the rate constant for 20 degree centigrade, but we know that at the sum in summer the temperature will go up to 25 degree centigrade and in winter it comes down up to 8 degree centigrade. So, we have to apply the corrections to the rate constants. So, that is the first step. So, we will see how to find out the temperature corrected rate constant. So, K25 is equal to 0 0.23 into, so this is the phi value which is already given. So, phi raise to T minus 20. So, T is 25 degree and phi is 1.06. So, you will be getting the K value or K25 was 0 0.31 per day and for winter we have to put the T as 8 degree centigrade. So, you will be getting the K8 or the rate constant at winter for a temperature of 8 degree centigrade as 0 0.11 per day. So, here we can see that as the temperature increases, the rate constant has increased from 2 0.23 to 0.31 and in winter when the temperature has come down, it has reduced drastically from 0.23 to 0.11. So, definitely the reaction rate will be affecting the performance of the system. So, this is an important step. So, now what we have to do? Okay, We have seen a family of curves earlier lecture. So, we using that figure we have to find out what is the k theta value for an efficiency of 90 percentage. So, if you want to achieve an efficiency of 90 percentage the left over s value will be 10 percentage. So, s by s naught will be 0 0.1 and we assume that the dispersion factor is 0 0.5 that means your pond system is in between a plug flow and a CSTR regime. So, that is why we are taking this dispersion factor as 0 0.5. So, for the dispersion factor of 0 0.5 and S by S naught value of 0 0.1, we can find out what is the k theta value from this family of curves whatever we have discussed earlier. Okay. So, here the percentage remaining 10 percentage and the family we have to see is D is equal to 0 0.5. So, you will be getting k theta value as 4 from this figure. So, this is the k theta value. So, that is what we have substituted here. So, k theta is coming as 4. So, you know what is the k value and you know the k theta value. So, we can find out theta. Theta is nothing but the hydraulic retention time. So, summer the hydraulic retention time required is 4 divided by 0 0.31 which is equal to 12.9 days and in winter the requirement is 4 by 0 0.11 because the rate constant is considerably low in winter time. So, we will be getting a hydraulic retention time of 36.4 days. But whenever we design a system, we have to design for the adverse condition. So, here we have to provide the maximum value of the hydraulic retention time. So, the hydraulic retention time for the present system should be 36.4 days. So, now what we have to do? We know the hydraulic retention time. We have to find out the volume of the ponds. So, how can we find out the volume of the ponds? It is nothing but hydraulic retention time into the flow rate. That means, this is the flow rate coming in and we have to keep the wastewater for such a long time. So, we will be able to get the volume. So, we know the hydraulic retention time and this is the flow rate during winter because we know that the extreme condition occurs in winter. So, we have to consider that flow rate. So, the volume is coming as 1,27,400 meter cube. So, we can use a series of ponds. This we have seen earlier. If you go for a series of ponds, the efficiency will be higher compared to a single pond because it will be approaching a plug flow regime than a single pond. So, since we are providing 3 ponds, the detention time of each pond will be around 12 days because 3 ponds are there. 
and each will be having a volume of 42,500. This is coming by dividing this 127,400 by 3. So, the pond system will be like this. This is the first pond. The influent is coming like this and from this one the influent is going to the second pond and from here it is coming to the third, third pond and finally, we will be getting the treated effluent. And in case of the first pond what is happening? The organic loading will be very, very high. So, we can even provide artificial aeration by providing mechanical aerators. So, now we have to find out what is the area requirement. So, provide a depth of 1.5 meter for the ponds. So, we can find out the area because we know the volume of one pond and we know what is the depth. So, we will be find able to find out what is the area. Area is nothing but volume divided by depth. So, it is coming as 28,333 meter square or it is 2.9 hectares. Okay. So, even though we are providing 1.5 meter as the depth, we have to give additional 1 meter depth because the wastewater whatever is coming to the pond will be having lot of suspended solids. So, it will be getting accumulated in the system. So, you should provide enough storage place. So, that is why apart from the working depth, we have to provide 1 meter additional depth for the storage of the sludge. Now, okay, we are assuming that the photosynthesis will not be sufficient to meet oxygen requirement in the primary pond throughout the year. So, we have to provide some aeration equipment. So, what we have to do? We have to see what is the detention time available during the summer because we have seen that during the summer the flow rate is very, very high. So, we can find out what is the theta value during the summer. So, we know the volume. Volume is a fixed quantity but only thing varying is the flow rate. So, summer time the flow rate is up to 5500 meter square per day. So, we can see what is the detention time available during summer. So, it is coming as 40 to 500 divided by 5500 which is equal to 7.7 .7 days. Okay. Though we are providing 12 days okay, in summer effective detention time is only 7.7 .7 days and the k theta value corresponding to this theta value is 2.39. Okay. So, he, we know what is the k value, we know the theta value so we can find out k theta value. So, once you know the k theta value and the dispersion coefficient we can refer back to the same figure and get what is the S by S naught value. That means, this will be the efficiency at that time. Okay. So, and this value we are getting from the family of curves and it is coming as 0.18. So, that means, we are able to achieve only 82 percentage of removal during summer time. So, BOD removed is equal to 0.82 into 250. So, 250 milligram per liter is the total BOD coming to the system. So, BOD removed is equal to 205 milligrams per liter. So, the oxygen requirement is 2 into 0 0.205 kilogram per meter cube into 5500. So, we are assuming that per 1 kilogram per kilogram of BOD, so we need 2 kilograms of oxygen. So, we can find out what is the total oxygen requirement. It is coming as 2255 kilograms per day. And we are assuming that the aerator oxygen transfer rate, we have seen this one in detail earlier. Uh, transfer rate is only 1 kilogram of oxygen per kilowatt hour. So, if this is the case, then we can find out what is the total kilowatt hour requirement. So, we know what is the total oxygen required and we know what is the oxygen transfer per kilowatt hour. So, we will be able to find out what is the total kilowatt hour. So, 2255 kilogram oxygen per day into 1 day by 24 hours because we want in terms of kilowatt hour. So, it is coming as 93.93 kilowatts. So, we, we can advise for 4 aerators at 24 kilowatt each. So, if you want to provide aerators, we have to provide 4 aerators of 24 kilowatt capacity in the primary and if the oxygen requirement is not sufficient, we can provide oxygen externally and we have discussed now how to design the aerators. And whenever we talk about the pond system, the k value 
varies, it is not a constant and it is temperature dependent value. So, mostly design is based on the loading factors and empirical equation and most of the time this pond systems are advice, advisable in the places where the temperature is reasonably, reasonably high. If you go for low temperature regions, what will happen in the winter season? Ice formation will be taking place in the top of the pond. So, virtually no treatment will be taking place in the pond. So, we have to provide a huge volume to contain all the waste water, whatever is coming during the winter time and the treatment will be taking place only in summer time. So, these ponds are better for the regions where the temperature will not fall too low. And we, we, we have also discussed about the polishing pond. So, how can we design a polishing pond? The same principle we can use and most of the time we go for the CSTR approach. So, in each system S0, SC by S0 is equal to 1 by 1 plus k theta. So, depending upon that one, okay, what is the number of microorganism you require finally, once the treatment is done, okay, based upon that one we can find out what is the number of ponds you have to give and what is the hydraulic retention time you have to provide. So, based upon that one we can design the system. And whenever we go for this polishing ponds, it is always advisable to go for a series of ponds having the same volume throughout because we have also discussed that if we go give series of ponds, the efficiency will be maximum if you provide the same hydraulic retention time or same volume in all the ponds. And one more thing is very, very important when we design a series of ponds, that two facultative ponds, it is always advisable to design in such a way that the first pond will not become anaerobic at any condition. If you want to maintain that condition by experiments, it is shown that the SC maximum, whatever is coming out from the first facultative pond should be more than 50 or 60 milligram per liter. If you put that condition for the domestic waste water, your first pond will now become anaerobic. So, that you will be getting a better efficiency at the end. So, now we will see what all are the things we have discussed today. We have seen what, what is a pond and what is the difference between a pond and a lagoon and what are the different types of ponds available and when we are using each variety. So, we have seen that if you want to go for a polishing pond, most of the time we go for aerobic ponds because all throughout the dissolved oxygen is available. And for municipal wastewater treatment, most of the time we go for facultative pond. And if you have high organic loading, high organic con concentration waste or high organic content waste, we it is always advisable to go for anaerobic pond because the oxygen requirement will be so high, we will not be able to provide sufficient oxygen. And we have also discussed what all are the design criteria used for the design of facultative pond. Okay. It is basically based on empirical approach and in the empirical approach we are seeing what is the algal production and what is the oxygen supply by the algae and what is the efficiency of the system. Based upon that one, we will be able to find out what is the area required and we have also seen that it is always better to go for a series of ponds instead of a single pond and the pond system will be effective only in regions where the temperature are relatively higher. If the temperature is lower, ice formation will be taking place in the top of the pond and it will be affecting or obstructing the sunlight passage through the system. So, naturally there will not be any photosynthesis and ultimately there will not be any treatment.